Paige vanished back in May of 1990. She was 30 years old. She disappeared along I-96 and the Fowlerville exit. Her car was found abandoned on the side of the road. The pictures that you're going to see are of six men. Investigators came up with the sketches based on various tips they received over the last year and a half. Investigators are trying now to put names with these faces. They have received tips on where Paige's body may be. Police plan on searching three Livingston County locations in the spring using new technology. The ground radar uh, was developed by the Army to uh, find the bodies of uh, soldiers that were buried during, then it has now been refined and uh, is being available to, a lot of times uh, cemeteries use it to find out if their plot is where it's supposed to be. It will show you a body that's in the ground. If you have information that can help police solve this cold case, if you recognize any of these sketches, please call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-SPEAK-UP. Hello, wonderful people. Today I want to talk about a 30-year-old case. Uh, this is the disappearance of Paige Ronkowski. Paige was only 30 years old when she went missing. She was engaged to a man named Steve Deborah Bander. She worked at a preschool as a teacher's aide and she was getting her degree in early childhood development. Paige wanted to work with deaf kids. At the time, Paige lived with her mother, Artis, in Okemos, Michigan, which is about 16 minutes from Lansing. And her wedding date was scheduled for November 30th of 1990, the year that she went missing. Paige was born February 2nd of 1960. She was the second, second oldest daughter out of four. Her sisters included Michelle, Tammy, and Cheryl. Her mom loved to talk about how inspiring she was even as a child. When she was four years old, she developed a temporary lisp and artists was so worried that the other kids were gonna pick on her daughter. But instead, they all started copying her list because they wanted to be like her. Paige had always wanted to be a mom. Um, growing up as a little girl, she would name all her dolls the same names that she planned on naming her future children. She also was involved in several activities in school. Paige was involved in drama. She was a talented singer and she even modeled at a few local fashion shows. She was also a cheerleader in high school, but she also loved to swim and she loved to skateboard. She, there wasn't anything that Paige wouldn't try. The morning of May 24th, 1990, Paige agreed to take her mother to the Detroit Metro Airport. Her mother was going to go to Atlanta, Georgia to see her sister, Michelle. They took her mother's employer's car, a 1986 Oldsmobile Cutlass Callus. When Paige dropped her mother off at the airport, it was about 1130. So she headed to Canton Township. She wanted, she went to meet up with a good friend of hers who just had a baby. And since it was such a beautiful day out, they went to the park for a few hours. Between 2.30 and 2.45, Paige stopped at a gas station west of I-275 where she bought a single bottle of beer and she was supposed to be headed to her fiance's softball game but Paige would never make it there. Around 3.30 as Paige was heading westbound she pulled over to the shoulder of I-96 and nobody knows to this day why she pulled over. She was only about a mile and a half uh, away from the town of Fowler's exit. There were several sightings of a pretty young blonde lady on the side of the road with a cutlass, but she wasn't alone. Many reported seeing two men with her. They were either African American, but other witnesses say Hispanic. There was a maroon or burgundy van parked behind her car, and she stood in between the two vehicles speaking to two men and one witness saw her raising her arms in the air as if, as if she was frustrated and one of the men reached over and put his hand on her, sh on her shoulder and that was one of the last sightings of Paige. 
It was a really busy day. Um, there was all kinds of traffic on the interstate. It was the Thursday before Memorial Day, and a lot of people were heading to Lake Michigan to celebrate. One driver drove by Page around 4 p.m., and when they were coming back the opposite way at 7.30 hours later, the car was still there. So they were worried and they called the police. Well, the police showed up and the scene was a lot different than most abandoned car scenes. But keep in mind, they didn't know that she was missing. So the, at first, the car was not processed as a crime scene. The keys were still in the ignition and the engine was running. The driver's side door was unlocked and the radio was on. Her purse was still in there, including money that she had in there, and her shoes were still in the vehicle, one of them shoved underneath the driver's side. There was an open bottle of beer next to the driver's seat, which I'm assuming is the beer that she had bought, and there was hardly any damage on the vehicle. There was a little bit of damage on the front end, but not enough for her to need to pull over or to have problems driving her vehicle. The deputy on the scene just thought that it was an abandoned vehicle, so he had it towed. In the meantime, Artis and Michelle were getting really worried. They were used to hearing from Paige often, several times a day, and Artis hadn't been able to get a hold of her daughter. So she called Steve, but Steve hadn't heard from Paige either. So she sent Steve over to her house to listen to her voicemails to see if she had left a message. Well, there was a message, it was from the deputy talking about towing the vehicle because he had found her information in her purse. This meant Paige was missing. So the next day, Steve went to the police department to report her as missing. Once they heard the situation, they decided to grab the cutlass and process it as a crime scene. The only real physical evidence they found, and it's really been the only physical evidence they've had, is different fingerprints and handprints on the vehicle. Um, the problem is they have never found a match, and it doesn't help that it was an employer car, so nobody's sure how many people have driven this car. At first, the police did consider Paige endangered missing. There was no evidence of voluntary disappearance. Her and Steve were having some problems, but she didn't plan on running. She still planned on marrying him. Not to mention, uh, right before she disappeared, she deposited a large sum of money into her bank account. And that bank account has never been touched. You know, most people, if they go missing, they take money out. Something else to point out is that in that area, there's been a lot of murders, it seems. Um, in the 80s, there were three women that were abducted and killed, and to this day, nobody has solved the murders. Seven months before Paige's disappearance, another woman went murdered in that area. Um, in fact, it was eerily similar to Paige's disappearance. They found the car, the car was found in Griffin Park, but inside the car was all of her personal belongings, no money stolen from her, and Griffin Park is actually the park that Paige went to that day with her friend. There's a theory that all these murders are connected to Paige's disappearance, or at least the murder seven months earlier. However, the police have never said anything about there being a connection to any of them. I do eventually want to do a video on the other victims around Fowler, Michigan, so keep your eyes peeled the next few weeks. There only have been two suspects in the case, and I'm not sure they were even qualified as suspects or if they were just persons of interest, but the first one when they found him, he was in prison in Michigan. He had gotten in trouble for carjacking, and it was a female victim, and it was in the same area as where Paige disappeared. However, they gave him a polygraph test, and he did pass it, so they dropped it. 
Another lead was a man in Detroit. He had a very violent history. Um, he had been arrested. I believe he was arrested for it. But he pulled alongside a woman driving around the same area that Paige went missing and flashed a badge trying to impersonate a police officer to get her to pull over. The theory was that he impersonated a police officer to get Paige to pull over or possibly somebody else. Um, I'm not sure what happened with this lead or this man, but I haven't seen anything else about him. Eventually, the case went from an endangered missing case to homicide. In 1999, the police received a hand-delivered anonymous tip. It was in the form of a letter and a map. It led them to a wooded area outside of Canton Township. However, her, nothing was found. Um, I did read, some people believe that they didn't read the map quite right, but who's to know? In 2011, um, the police spoke to a woman who claimed that her and a friend had found cement covered boots around the time that Paige disappeared and so they used ground penetrating radar to search a pond off of Nicholson Road near Grand River, but no body was found. Don't quote me on this, but from what I understood, um, the next lead was in the same area as the pond since they didn't find anything with the radar, they used cadaver dogs. The dogs had picked up a scent on a tree lined driveway, but again, nothing was found. Paige's mother, artist, turned this tragedy into something productive. She never gave up hope on Paige coming home, but she was realistic. She knew that if Paige did come home, she might not be alive. Artist became a big advocate for the missing. She was the leader of Parents of Murdered Children, and she was also one of the board members for the Missing in Michigan annual event. In 2015, the police established the Artist Ringkowski Advocacy Award. Unfortunately, it was either 2016 or 2017. Uh, Artist took a pretty hard fall and she ended up paralyzed. And in December of 2017, she passed away. Artist never got to know what happened to her daughter. When she passed away, her family held a double ceremony for both her and Paige. Michelle still keeps in touch with authorities on her sister's case. Paige was 5'6", and she weighed 125 pounds when she went missing. She had blonde hair and blue eyes. She had a scar on the inside of her right arm, as well as a scar on both of her knees. Her left knee had surgical screws in them, and her right knee had been replaced. When Paige went missing, she was wearing a white blouse, baggy silk pants with flowers on them, as well as a long beaded necklace. It's the same outfit that you're seeing right now on the screen. If you know anything, please call the Livingston Sheriff's Department at 517 five four zero seven eight seven nine the number is listed in the description box below i think artis is a brave and strong woman for everything that she went through and everything that she did and she never stopped fighting for Paige. and it's just sad that she didn't get to know what happened to her daughter before she passed away that's why I just, I hope this case is solved really soon so at least her sisters can know what happened to her. I listed Michelle's GoFundMe page down in the description box as well. I believe it's to raise money, you know, to help print missing posters and help and things like that. If you have a Midwest case suggestion, drop me a comment below. If you like my content, please hit the like button and subscribe. Until next time.